Richard B. Hayes contends that the opening lines of the Pauline epistles, specifically Paul's letter to the Galatians, set the tone for the entire scripture, contrary to prior interpretations that overlook this passage. Interpreters were often distracted by Paul's assertive declaration of his divine mandate, the lack of a preliminary thanksgiving, or the subsequent sections addressing the law, faith, justification, or moral exhortations. Also, some critics felt Paul's use of plural sins and lack of justification language suggested he was using a traditional phrase that did not represent his unique beliefs. However, Hayes suggests that the greeting of Galatians alludes to the story of Jesus Christ sent by God to liberate humans from sin and death, representing bondage to the current evil age. This narrative framework informs Paul's message of the justification of Gentiles and his arguments against the imposition of circumcision on Galatian believers. Hayes cites J. Louis Martin's work on Pauline theology, which suggests that Paul's letter to Galatians should be read as an apocalyptic proclamation of the gospel. This view contrasts with earlier characterizations of Galatians as a non-apocalyptic outlier. According to Martin, God's saving action is depicted through images of invasion and battle, indicating a need to read Paul as an apocalyptic theologian. His view has gained widespread acceptance in contemporary Pauline scholarship. Hayes acknowledges the ongoing debates about apocalyptic elements in Paul's letters, emphasising the need for further examination of these issues. Thus, the Pauline epistles should be read as theological works with narrative elements that encapsulate Christ's story, redefining the message of the gospel within the present evil age. Moreover, the term apocalyptic is used in the context of Paul's letter to the Galatians, not to identify genre or historical motifs, but to describe a specific set of theological claims and commitments. These are seen as being analogous to Jewish apocalyptic thought, thus providing a type of theological DNA. Three key characteristics of this apocalyptic DNA can be identified. Firstly, it accentuates divine initiative and action as the basis for salvation and hope, instead of human religious practice or subjective disposition. This stance is illustrated by Paul's correction in Galatians 4, 9, stating that rather than knowing God, we have been known by God. God is the primary agent, and humans the receivers of his gracious action. The second criterion is an apocalyptic perspective of two ages, the old full of sin and death, and the new age of freedom, righteousness and life. This new age isn't brought about through human deeds, but through the will of God. In Christ, everything is made new. Thirdly, there is a perceived break with Judaism, salvation history, and with Israel as defined in the past. Paul speaks of his former life in Judaism, and warns the Galatians that they will cut themselves off from Christ by undergoing circumcision. These radical shifts are said to be due to the dawning of a new age. This third aspect, although most contentious, is also seen to align with the Reformation's traditional law-gospel antithesis and anti-Jewish interpretations of Paul. Even scholars sensitive to the potential issues of this interpretation tend to portray Paul as having decisively broken from Israel's history. Furthermore, Hayes proposes an understanding of Paul's scripture in Galatians that refutes the notion of a total discontinuity between the Jewish tradition and the church. Instead, Hayes affirms Paul's two-age schema view that sees the inauguration of a new age in Christ, not as a rejection of Israel's sacred history, but a reconfiguration of Israel's story in light of God's new acts of redemption through Christ and the Spirit. Paul's reading and interpretation of the scripture are key constituents of his apostolic mission. Hayes takes issue with the dichotomy of apocalypse and salvation history, and asserts that while Israel's sacred history serves as a precursor to the gospel, it is not a linear progression towards fulfilment. Rather, this sacred history has to be re-read under spiritual guidance in light of Christ's fulfilment. He notes that God's apocalyptic act in Christ does not destroy creation and covenant, but rather reinterprets them under the guidance of the Spirit. To appreciate Paul's apocalyptic interpretation, Hayes urges readers to consider the role of the gospel in creatively reconstructing the world. He highlights that the rhetoric and theology in Galatians 
are intrinsically apocalyptic and play a significant role in changing the symbolic world of the readers. Paul uses language and imaginations to present a world filled with spiritual conflict and power, where God's spirit battles oppressive forces, seeking freedom from subjugation. Hayes suggests that Paul, a devotee of Jewish law, who once persecuted the church, received the apocalypse of Jesus Christ and dedicated himself to spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. According to Hayes, Paul was more of a charismatic strong poet preacher rather than a traditional writer. His writing is filled with rich narrative allusions, metaphorical linkages, and aggressive and hyperbolic rhetoric, by which he calls Christian believers to stand firm in faith, hope, and love. In addition, in Galatians, the Apostle Paul utilises an array of apocalyptic imagery and motifs to shape the imaginative matrix within which he wanted his readers to perceive the world. Paul stresses that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead in order to rescue humanity from the present evil age. He acknowledges the presence of genuine and malevolent angels in the world, indicating that God's messages can be received through them. Paul maintains his gospel, received through divine revelation, and depicts his opposition as false brothers under a curse. Paul depicts himself and his followers as being previously enslaved under the basic elements of the world, but says that God's Son has been sent to free his people and send God's Spirit to them. He contrasts the present enslaved Jerusalem with the eschatological Jerusalem above, which is free. He uses an allegorical reading of the Sarah Hagar story to paint this image. Paul suggests a future day of judgment, making a distinction between those who live in God's new creation and those who do not, rendering the practice of circumcision irrelevant. He portrays the pre- and post-events of Jesus' death and resurrection as distinctly different eras and explains how they have drastically changed the context of human existence. Ultimately, he shows God, Jesus Christ and the Spirit as the key players bringing a transformed world into being. Paul's apocalyptic imaginative poesis features God as Father, the passion of Jesus' death as the significant liberating event, and the concept of our union with Christ. Everything outlined in Paul's letter builds a symbolic world where all actions of saving God's people are God's doing. In this world, superhuman powers exist, battling to enslave or liberate humankind. Although salvation has been secured through Jesus' crucifixion, the fulfilment of God's righteousness remains a future hope. The faithful are called to walk in the Spirit and resist the old age powers that strive to return them to bondage. Further, in his letter to the Galatians, Apostle Paul demystifies the themes of paternity and sonship as interconnected images, alluding to the broader biblical narrative of Gentile adoption into the covenant people. In this, he uses the term father sparingly to name God, but with great theological significance. God is depicted as the initiator of Jesus' saving act and the one guiding its spread through Paul's apostolic activity. In this biblical narrative, God's paternal role emerges strongly. He is portrayed as the sovereign sender, initiating the saving act by sending his son to redeem his people under the law. This act grants them the status of sonship, and God further sends the Spirit into their hearts, allowing them to cry out, Abba, Father! Paul points out the images of paternity and sonship, referring to Jesus as the Son of God and his people as sons and daughters of God inevitably linking them together. Paul's emphasis on the theme of inheritance for the sons of God indicates that his Gentile readers in Galatia are now part of Israel, the people promised an inheritance. Throughout biblical history, God's paternal relationship to Israel is repeated via the prophets, including Moses, Isaiah and Jeremiah. This relationship promulgates the hope that God will restore Israel allowing them to keep the commandments of the Torah and reaffirms his paternal link with his people who will ultimately return from exile. Paul reassures the Galatians that they are all members of the Israel of God, affirming their participation in the covenant of promise. But their sonship is not due to adherence to the Torah, but rather assured through Jesus Christ's death and their baptism. Here, 
God's covenant with Israel is not rejected, but rather reframed. While the languages of God's paternity and God's people's sonship assure the Galatians of their position within God's covenant community, it promotes an apocalyptic emphasis on the fatherhood of God, creating a new eschatological covenant community. Besides, Hayes discusses the centrality of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to the theology of Paul, specifically within the biblical letter to the Galatians. The article notes the repeated theme of Jesus giving himself up for the sins of humanity in Paul's narration. Paul's reference to his co-crucifixion with the Son of God implies a self-sacrificial love which forms the basis of his appeal for the community to serve each other in love, bearing each other's burdens, reflecting the selflessness revealed in Jesus Christ's death. Paul in his letter strongly reiterates the self-sacrifice of Jesus through the crucifixion, presenting it as an act of absolute love and redemption. For instance, Paul interprets the crucifixion as Jesus becoming a curse for humanity's redemption, Galatians 3.13. Further references to Jesus' death repeat the narrative of freedom and redemption brought about by his sacrifice, Galatians 4.4. 4. 4, 5, 5, 1. Faithfulness, marked by Jesus' willing crucifixion, is a recurring theme in Paul's references. This faithfulness is proposed to indirectly underline the centrality of the cross to Paul's gospel message, further stressing this interpretation. Paul continues positioning the cross as the focal point of his preaching. He criticises those who preach circumcision to avoid the persecution that comes with the controversial message of the cross. Instead, he takes pride in the cross of Jesus, Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, 6, 14. Paul views the crucifixion as a cataclysmic event leading to the death of the old world and paving the way for a new creation through the resurrection of Jesus and the work of the Spirit. This view situates the cross as an apocalyptic turning point in cosmic history. Therefore, any theology deriving from Galatians must wrestle with its cross-centred apocalyptic worldview. Additionally, Hayes discusses the participation in Christ, an essential motif in Christian belief signifying the union of believers with Christ. He attempts to answer critical questions about the implications of Christ's cross and the transformation of non-believers into God's sons, through a series of metaphors drawn from Paul's teachings. Hayes delineates this mysterious union as an intertwining of destinies where one's fate is closely linked to Jesus' death and resurrection. This union is described through examples such as Paul's crucifixion with Christ, the association of Christians with the promised messianic seed, and the embodiment of Christ through baptism. Paul regularly uses the phrase in Christ to depict his existence and the churches. This phrase encapsulates the different metaphors portraying the union with Christ. The theological term that best summarises these passages is participation in Christ. Even though Paul does not use this term, it succinctly captures the essence of texts. Hayes suggests adopting the Greek term metousia, used by Gregory of Nyssa in his interpretation of Paul's teachings, which translates to participation. Hayes explains that participation in Christ forms the dominant paradigm in Galatians for understanding how Christ saves his followers. Believers' union with Christ forms the framework for salvation, rather than righteousness through faith, as was normally underscored in Pauline theology. Consequently, Hayes emphasises that any theology derived from the teachings in Galatians must adequately address the significance of this union with Christ as both the means and meaning of salvation. Also, this essay explores the theological implications and consequences of reading the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians through the frame of 1, 3, 5. In this passage, God's Son, Jesus Christ, is seen as sent by the Father to sacrifice himself and therefore save humanity from evil. The essay suggests that theology and church practices should be understood in the light of this event. The essay identifies the narrative as apocalyptic, focused on God's intervention to end an era of enslavement and usher in a new one. However, unlike other Jewish apocalyptic narratives, Paul's letter to the Galatians lacks interest in specific future events or current political occurrences.
The essay identifies three significant themes. Firstly, God's unexpected act of grace, creating a new community. This community continues Israel's covenant line, but surprisingly includes Gentiles. This challenges quick judgments about Paul's views on supersessionism. Secondly, the cross is seen as the central, transformative event, accentuating the depth of human bondage to death and God's profound grace and love. God's method of salvation here is distinctively non-violent. Lastly, the essay proposes that humans receive God's salvation by being incorporated into Christ. This participatory concept of salvation has many theological implications. It links justification and sanctification tightly together, affirming the unity of the Church. The radical vision of unity in Galatians 3.28, transcending ethnic, social and gender divisions, is seen as a normative vision of the Christian community. Last but not least, Hayes reflects on the pastoral theology style of Paul in Galatians, identifying him to three styles. As a hermeneutical theologian, a big thinker, unafraid to challenge conventions, and embracing polemic when necessary. Hayes stresses that Paul is a hermeneutical theologian, which places importance on the study and interpretation of the scriptures. Faced with challenges to his understanding of the gospel, Paul frequently returns to a fervent study of the Israelite scriptures, drawing congregants into the stories of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, teaching them how to read and interpret the scriptures. As a big thinker, Hayes notes that Paul wasn't afraid to relate the controversies in his churches to the broader narrative of the gospel. Instead of resorting to public opinion, common custom or conventions, he took a radical approach in retelling the gospel story and framing problems within this context. Hayes suggests that modern theology can learn from this strategy, advising against tinkering with adjustments and suggesting that fundamental questions may need grander thinking. Finally, Hayes suggests that Paul was not afraid of polemics and confrontation. While some sectors of the church may lend themselves to a polemical tone, other pastoral approaches prefer an inclusive, non-judgmental tone. In Hayes's view, Galatians offers a vital reminder of the importance of maintaining the irrefutable call of the gospel, even when under threat from forces that could corrupt or undermine the message of Jesus Christ. The task for the modern church is in identifying times of confessional status or spiritual crisis in which to apply these principles. In conclusion, Hayes explores the opening lines of the letter to the Galatians in the Pauline epistles, debating they set the narrative framework for the scripture. Unlike previous interpretations that overlooked this passage, Hayes posits that the greeting alludes to the story of Jesus Christ sent by God to free humans from sin. This narrative informs Paul's message of justifying Gentiles and his arguments against imposing circumcision on Galatian believers. Hayes cites J. Louis Martin, suggesting that Galatians should be seen as an apocalyptic proclamation of the gospel, readable as an apocalyptic theology, a view now accepted widely in contemporary teachings. Hayes acknowledges debates around apocalyptic aspects in Paul's letters, encouraging further examination of these issues. Understanding of Paul's scripture in Galatians refutes the idea of total discontinuity between the Jewish tradition and the church. Rather, Hayes suggests Paul's view sees the new age in Christ as not a rejection of Israel's sacred history, but a reconfiguration in light of God's new acts of redemption. Hayes disputes the dichotomy of apocalypse and salvation history and asserts that while Israel's sacred history serves as a precursor to the gospel, it is not a linear progression towards fulfilment. Moreover, the article discusses the importance of the father-son relationship in Paul's letter. God, as the father, is seen as the initiator of Jesus' saving act and the guide of its spread through Paul's apostolic activity. The themes of paternity and sonship allude to Gentile adoption into the covenant people, assuring the Galatians of their place within God's covenant community. Furthermore, Hayes highlights the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as being central to Paul's theology. Jesus' self-sacrifice is repeatedly indicated as the absolute act of love and redemption, interpreted as the apocalyptic turning point in cosmic history.
This centrality of the cross in Paul's preaching is a vital component of his apocalyptic worldview. In addition, Hayes investigates the mystery of participation in Christ, the union of believers with Christ, which is seen both as the means and the meaning of salvation. This participation forms the framework for salvation instead of righteousness through faith. Lastly, Hayes reflects on Paul's style as a pastoral theologian, identifying him as a hermeneutical theologian, a big thinker unafraid to challenge conventions, and one who embraces polemic when necessary. The article affirms the importance of maintaining the undeniable call of the gospel, even when under threat from forces that could corrupt or undermine Jesus Christ's message.